I'm Cassandra Parkinson and I'm the, a member of the New South Wales Committee of ABC Friends. And the event today is being hosted by ABC Friends New South Wales with the assistance of our national body. More than 500 people have expressed interest or have registered from across Australia. So I'm very pleased to welcome everyone and particularly our interstate guests. It's great to have such, such interest. And as I'm in Sydney, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land here, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and also to elders in other parts of Australia. As you know, this, is, this event is really coming at a crucial time for the ABC. We're in the lead up to a budget, and that's following years of funding cuts, um, that have meant the loss of very many jobs, uh, more than a thousand jobs, and many, many programs and services. And the latest cuts that you know of that, that have just occurred over the last uh, couple of months, well, they're the result of decisions made, you know, in 2018. They've resulted in even more programs lost and even, you know, wonderful ABC staff who are um, being, you know, being made redundant or, uh, and, it's heartbreaking actually. And we do believe that the ABC is reaching crisis point. So this webinar is really very well timed to hear from the three of you to get your perspective, not just on funding, but on the issues facing the ABC. Uh, for anyone who uh, has lived in some sort of cocoon for the last 40 years, Kerry O'Brien is a multi award winning journalist and he's presented uh, the ABC's flagship programs over many years, Late Line, 7.30 Report and Four Corners. And if, like me, you were watching Q&A the other night, you were probably thinking, damn it, you know, why aren't you still at the ABC? We really welcome watching you there. Um, Emma Dawson's the Executive direct, uh, Director of Per Capita. That's an independent think tank, which tries to look at the bigger picture, to look at policy issues and do research that goes beyond just the day-to-day -day news cycle. Um, and Emma is the author of a recent report that you, many people would be aware of called It's Our ABC. That's an invaluable report. I've certainly drawn on it in the last you know, little while and I'm sure many others have too. Ed Davis is the president of ABC Friends New South Wales and ACT. He's a very strong advocate for the, for the ABC and um, He's uh, really been a fantastic leader of our organisation in recent years. So it, it's a great pleasure to invite all of you to speak today. And I think that uh, without further ado, um, we might um, invite uh, Kerry to, uh, to start the proceedings. Thanks, Cassandra. I just had to change chairs. I was, my chair was squeaking. <laughs> I didn't want you to think it might be my joints. <laughs> um, I, uh, I dropped in on the ABC on Monday night, as Kendra, Cassandra said, to, um, to be on, on uh, Q&A. And uh, I found it, even before I went in to start the show, I, I uh, was struck by the sadness of the occasion because I was meeting so many um, ABC studio staff who had served the ABC so loyally for decades. Uh, one person... Uh, in two stints, had, has worked at the ABC for 45 years. Um, another uh, 29 continuous years, and this was her last night. And I've worked on her on every current affairs program, studio-based current affairs program I've worked on. She's worked on practically every outside broadcast you've seen in the last 20 odd years. Uh, all of the specials, the sporting events, She's worked on every current affairs program. She was just one of the, I won't mention her by name because I don't want to embarrass her. Uh, but, uh, but on the night, she shed a tear at the end because, and, and even though she was optimistic in terms of her own personal life, she shed a tear because after all this time, and nobody I've known in all my years at the ABC would have been more passionate about the place than her. Nobody in management, she said, had, had rung, uh, emailed, sent a note, anything uh, to acknowledge her contribution to the ABC and the fact that she was going. And I, uh, I wondered whether that was being replicated 
uh, with so many of the others who, uh, who are in the process of being shown the door. And I was terribly conscious of the combined weight of experience of people who are leaving or have left the ABC. And it's a moment uh, for real sadness and it's a moment for serious concern. And, uh, and when we discussed some of the big issues um, that were on the menu on Monday night, again, uh, when I went home, I was, uh, I was reflecting on the fact that so many of these issues are not being properly reported. They're not being properly analysed. They're not being analysed with a consistency across the board. And I have to say, sadly, to some degree at least, that's true at the ABC too. Um, I see uh, an issue like China and, uh, and the willingness of, um, of our national government uh, to follow the path laid out for by, our, by our intelligence agencies. Um, I uh, am always uneasy about the whole concept of intelligence services because they're a secret world. And the more secret uh, a country is, uh, the less democratic it is, almost invariably. And, uh, and the more open a society you are, the chances are you're going to be more democratic or the, the state of your democracy is going to be healthier. Uh, our intelligence services uh, may have and have always had a number of dedicated, um, intelligent um, uh, people who are entirely capable of very good analysis. But they also, uh, there is, a, there is a, a part of the culture which is that it, it certainly doesn't do any harm for intelligence agencies to be able to convince a nation of their importance and of their need to have resources. And so they are collectors of resources and the more resources they get, the more they feel they have to justify their existence. And the more they justify their existence, the more resources they get. And potentially they become more and more powerful inside government, but they are in a secret world and the intelligence that they give to government far more often than not is secret. And then the government turns to us, the public and says, uh, look, we've been warned about this or we've been warned about that. There are serious national security concerns. I can't tell you in detail because that's secret. That's for me to know and you, you've just got to trust me. Well, the fact is our intelligence agencies got it wrong on two disastrous wars that Australia was pulled into uh, with America. Both of them built on lies. One was Vietnam and the other was Iraq. Uh, both disastrous wars and neither war uh, should we have been in and history says that now. We know that and we know that they came at a cost in all sorts of ways, ways we don't even begin to think about. The impact of our place in those wars uh, within our region and how we're perceived by our neighbours as a result. And to come back to the ABC here, the thing that really concerns me um, about, about our, our reporting, that is the, the national media's reporting, of all of these national security issues, including China, is that I see so many stories now that are clearly being sourced from our intelligence agencies with quite senior journalists reporting the information. And it seems to me, I see no sign of, of that information being questioned. Mm. It seems to me it's being accepted and just laid out there. And it might be nice for a journalist to have stuff fed to them that sounds, sounds a bit sexy and it's a bit spicy and it has a note of urgency about it. And you, you kind of it puts you in there in the debate and you're breaking stuff. But where is the evidence that you're actually questioning it? and that you, you are doing your job. Now, the, the, the more the ABC is wounded, the less likely it is going to be able to do that job. And China is just one illustration. You know, we all know about the existential nature of the, of the climate change uh, threat. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, I watch the quality of Fairfax falling away in front of my eyes. I'll say nothing more about, uh, about News Corp than I've already said in the past. We all have our views about News Corp and it's unhealthy place in our media landscape and, and the anti-democratic threat that it represents simply because 70% of Australia's print output is controlled by one media owner um, with a certain amount of mind think within that 70% plus those other strands like Sky and so on. But the combination of our two most powerful uh, most influential media group, groups and the quality or not that is emanating from them is a matter for deep concern and just throws up how important the ABC is in this day and age. Uh, one of the other topics that we touched on the other night was the issue of um, 
uh, of uh, Colin Barnett, the former Premier of Western Australia, was talking about the wonderful egalitarian nature of Australian society. Well, I'm afraid he's wrong, sadly. You know, there, there are some Australian characteristics that I hope will never change. And there is a sense of a fair go amongst individual Australians, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to kind of exaggerate that either. But when you have 1% uh, of the nation's income being hoovered up, sorry, when you have, when you have 1% of Australians hoovering up as much wealth as another 70% of Australians, when you see, as we have in recent years, until the pandemic struck, uh, poverty rising year by year, including poverty amongst the young, um, when you see in the space of eight years, no, less than eight years, in the space of six years, when you see poverty jump by a million people from 2012 to, um, to uh, 2018, by a million people, uh, these are matters for serious concern. You put them all together. And when, as I said the other night, you're seeing that the wages of the young are not just being suppressed, they are actually going backwards. Put all these things together, and we are right now not a fair or equal society. We are not now in a healthy state, and nor is our democracy. And when you put that against what we're seeing in the United States, um, and you see the trend in the States, we are at an earlier stage in walking down that same road. And, uh, and while uh, the, the kind of authoritarian bent of Donald Trump and where that is taking America is a matter for grave concern for us all, Australia is not that far down that road yet, but we are edging down the, the authoritarian road ourselves as evidenced by things like those raids on the ABC. So, so all of these things add up to the fact that we have never needed the ABC as much as we need it now. And yet at this time, we're seeing so much talent and so much experience walking out the door, never to be restored. Uh, and we know that the punishment is not going to stop. The people who in the background who are driving this, this terrible kind of ongoing assault on the ABC, this ideological hatred, uh, they're not gonna stop until we're privatized or gone. And there are various theories floating around about uh, about how, you know, that the ultimate agenda of the government is to retain a kind of a regional rump, an ABC rump that services rural and regional Australia. Um, I, look, I, I, I always hesitate to walk down the road of, of, of theories unless I see the evidence. I'm not quite sure about that. But what I am sure about is that, uh, is that, is that the, the pattern of the conservative governments uh, since 2013, has been not just to whittle, but to actually scissor big strands off the ABC budget. And I think really for the, I mean, I've, I've seen these processes over many years and I've seen the slow erosion of quality. I've seen the, the cost cutting and the corner cutting and the doing without this and doing without that and cutting back from on travel, for instance, at, at a particular time or another, the departure of people uh, the, the increasing casualisation of the ABC, the increasing trend to short-term contracts, all of these things are adding up to a crisis that I think we are now in. I think the ABC has lost its way. This is an incredibly difficult time uh, for any media outlet to be trying to, to stabilise and secure its place on the media landscape. And it would be hard enough to do, even if we were well-funded and well-resourced, and if we did feel that we had genuine support from government. Uh, but to, to be trying to re-establish and maintain uh, a relevance uh, in, in this shifting media landscape uh, is an almost impossible task. People are not valued in the ABC anymore. The quality they represent is not being valued in the ABC anymore. I'm not gonna throw my hands up and despair about it because I do believe we have to keep fighting. Uh, and I, I think uh, the, the job that, that Friends of the ABC have done over years has been really quite a precious part of the whole thing. I have to say that it's meant a great deal to me over decades to know that you guys are there and that you are prepared to put in the time and to keep the flame alive, if you like, and to keep the passion burning. Um, 
because we do have to keep confronting the broader public about this. We do have to, to keep the issue right up there, front and centre, as we move towards the next federal election and, uh, and pick our marks like Eden Monero. Um, where uh, I, I think, and, and it was a, that was a critical electorate in terms of the ABC, because of course the ABC played such a vital role uh, when those bushfires hit. And it's done that, it's been doing that for years now. It did it with the big, big Victorian fires earlier in the century. Uh, and it's done, it, it's done it with cyclones in Queensland and so on. And yet still we get smacked in the chops. So um, I would just say to everybody that um, I know that you value the ABC. I know there's nothing I can say today that will surprise you or, or, or cause you to think, oh, gee, I hadn't thought of that. I'll bet you've thought of everything I've had to say already. But, uh, but please don't give up the fight. Thanks. Thanks, Kerry. That, that was a good ending too. It was very sobering. Yeah, it's clap, clap from everyone. Um, it, sobering, but a reminder, we've got to keep at it. And now we have Emma with a lovely little guest with her <laughs> to, to, uh, to follow on from Kerry. That'd be great. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Cassandra. Bye-bye. <laughs> and, and thanks, Kerry. She's, she has an immaculate sense of timing. She's clearly going to be a performer one day. Um, uh, thank you very much. Ha a very hard act to follow, as always. Um, but uh, nodding vociferously, well, not you can't nod vociferously, although perhaps that's a new Zoom technique, um, but nodding furiously along with everything you said, as were many people in the chat function. Um, as well. And um, I'd like to start by saying that I, I'm with you today um, from St Kilda, Victoria, where we're in lockdown and I'm on the lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and of course, as well as being the executive director of Per Capita and the author of the recent report with Get Up or For Get Up, um, it was my own work, I should claim any faults or responsibilities for that, on the impact of recent budget uh, cuts I was also the advisor for five years to the former communications minister Steve Roy, in the Rudd and Gillard governments and worked very hard in that role to try uh, to support the ABC with increased funding. Um, the independent board appointment process was, I think, probably the reason Stephen hired me was my attempts to do something about that before I went to work for him. Um, and other measures such as uh, ensuring that digital um, broadcasting was put into the charter. Um, but that's not to say that the ABC hasn't suffered for decades from hostility from all, all sides of government. It does. And that's the role of a good public broadcaster is to question power and question authority. But I don't think we've seen anything like um, what we've seen over the last seven years from this government. It is almost unprecedented. It is unprecedented in terms of its ongoing hostility and the blatant um, disregard for any norms or even any shame um, in the way that they have approached our national broadcaster at the same time as giving, I think it's now over $40 million to Foxtel um, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been um, almost breathtaking to see the um, sheer audacity with which this has been done. And then the audacity of the Minister and the Prime Minister uh, after the release of my report earlier this year to come out and say there are no cuts. Um, the ABC's funding is going up year on year, um, which was blatant misrepresentation. Uh, of course, they, they managed this through two slights of hand, the first of which was to include broadcast funding um, in their operational funding. So the money that now goes and has since Peter Costello sold off the National Broadcast Network in the late 90s uh, to Broadcast Australia, which is a fixed contract. The ABC has no control over that money and cannot make savings in that area. So to include broadcast funding in their headline funding is quite misleading. Um, and the second thing, of course, was they ignored inflation. So they were talking about nominal increases rather than real increases uh, over the last seven years and forward to the end of 2022. And my research found that the ABC has lost almost $800 million um, under this government. And that research was not based, as the Minister suggested uh, to the Daily Telegraph, in my uh, determination to find a biased result because of my, my past working for a Labor Minister. Um, it was taken from the government's own budget papers, and they quite proudly trumpeted those cuts at the time they were announced as budget savings. Efficiency dividends is the other word for them, of course. And um, quite proudly, I think, when I 
when I worked for uh, Stephen Conroy, we were successful in lobbying uh, Cabinet to remove the ABC from efficiency dividends um, on the argument that they were an independent statutory body rather than a government agency. And that was reversed uh, immediately by the Abbott government. So this is, has been an out and out quite hostile um, and deliberate attempt to neuter our public broadcaster um, and the very important role that it plays that Kerry's alluded to in our democracy uh, because as he has said um, the loss particularly of the independent voice of Fairfax over the last year or so and another um, area I've worked on for many years is media diversity laws which were completely trashed um, under Turnbull who has always professed to be a great friend of journalists and a great friend of the ABC um, and as I have said to him more than once your actions uh, speak uh, your actions belie your words Malcolm um, we saw you know significant cuts to the ABC and the reduction of those laws that protected um, the diversity of voices such as they were in our media landscape before uh, his government uh, under his watch um, and so we now do have the situation where if you're in Queensland or South Australia or Tasmania uh, your only newspaper is a Murdoch paper uh, you don't have you do have access to say the Australian Financial Review but there's um, a distinct bent in that publication as well um, that that skews towards the more um, I, I want to say conservative voice but this actually brings me to the point that there's nothing conservative about trashing our institutions. There's nothing conservative about undermining the institutions that uphold our democracy and uphold our traditions of civic debate and democratic engagement. Uh, it's actually an extremely reactionary position and it's more akin to the kind of Tea Party politics that we've seen emerge in the US over recent years and have led to now what we see there is effectively a society on the brink of civil war over racial and cultural issues. Um, and I agree with Kerry that we are, we are further back on that road, but we are on the same trajectory here. It's largely because of the influence of um, vested, very powerful interests. Um, and most obviously that is the Murdoch press, but they represent a much uh, greater force. And, Kerry was right to allude to, you know, the role of um, intelligence agencies, the secrecy that surrounds um, those processes, but also that that extends to the secrecy and lack of transparency around the operation of capital and money in our society, around the, um, the, the measures that have been put in place quite deliberately over 30 years and particularly over the last decade since the GFC to undermine those institutions that allow us to, um, to claim a share of our commonwealth for working people and to funnel that wealth to the chosen few. We are seeing the erosion of uh, centuries gains towards a more egalitarian society, not just in Australia, but in the US and Europe and the UK as well. And it's not an accident. It's quite a deliberate plan. The role of journalists in interrogating these things and in questioning the information that's given to them, whether it's by an intelligence agency or a PR release from a big uh, big business lo corporate lobbyist or from government um, is absolutely fundamental to our, our ability to understand the decisions that are being taken that affect our lives and to inform how we vote. Um, and we saw at the last election that a majority of Australians voted against their own self-interest. They voted against the things that would make their lives materially better and improve the standard of living for them and their children. And now for the first time, we have a generation of Australians whose standards of living is going backwards compared to their parents. So the majority of Australians under 35 now, close just over 50%, uh, have never had a job with sick pay or annual leave. Uh, they are either on part-time casual or uh, fixed-term contracts. They are unable to get into the housing market. They're often unable even to rent a property that's within a decent commute of their jobs. And we're not talking here about um, the very lowest paid workers, although the, the situation of the low paid in this country is, is appalling. But even people like nurses and paramedics and teachers who cannot afford to live within an hour of where their essential work is needed. And we hear nothing about this in the press because the press now is, is, is uh, so traduced and it's partly to do with the loss of funding for journalism because of the collapse of the business model that's been brought about by multinational internet companies. Um, but it's also to do with a, a, a rush to ensure that everything, uh, we, we get clicks on, on links and we make profits ahead of the fundamental role of journalism. And in the face of that, 
a public broadcaster that doesn't rely on advertising revenue and should be able to be uh, secured from that threat and funded in a way that will allow it to continue to perform that essential role is absolutely critical. And yet we have a government now that seems to be working hand in hand with those corporate interests to undermine the ABC at the very time that we're seeing that quality journalism collapse in the commercial sector. Um, I, 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 like Kerry, will not throw up my hands in despair. I will continue to fight because there is no alternative. Um, but the only possible way that we can continue to um, protect and fight for our national broadcaster and for the effect, essential role of journalism to us as citizens in a democracy is through our sheer force of our numbers and sheer force of our voices um, to stand up and say that it's not a government broadcaster, it's not the government's plaything, it's our broadcaster, it's the public's broadcaster and its role is absolutely fundamental to how we to how we experience our lives as Australians and to how we are able to ensure that we are voting for the policies that will support ourselves and our children and our grandchildren to continue to have a safe and secure life in what is one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Thanks Emma. Um, more salutary words I mean in a sense I was thinking you paint a picture of us being closer to the US than we might like to, th you know, the US so-called dream and we might like to really acknowledge. Um, and I think it was very important that you gave us that broader context to remind us, you know, in another way of how important the ABC is. Ed, it's your turn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cassandra. And it's just been fantastic to hear from uh, Kerry and, and Emma. Uh, it, it's a great privilege to be on a platform with uh, with both of you. Kerry, obviously a very highly uh, respected fixture on the screens of so many of us for, for so long, perhaps decades. Kerry, for me, you set the standard for investigative journalism uh, in Australia, always determined to get at the truth of issues, always fair and, and always unflinching. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to share a platform with you. And Emma, too, um, you know, your, your work in the minister's office was wonderful. Uh, it, it really made a difference. Uh, and obviously, all of us, I think, listening to this would, uh, would wish you were back there and uh, able, to, uh, uh, able to feed in good ideas and uh, see some things implemented. But also your report for uh, Get Up was, was excellent and it really put the spotlight uh, on the debate uh, about ABC funding, and it and it achieved an enormous amount uh, of, uh, of of attention. Um, I'm going to try and be quite brief. I've got this is always difficult for an academic, by the way, but I will try and be quite brief. And um, I I want to make three points. First of all, I've been very frustrated by the debate that arose out of Emma's report because it was this the government very craftily uh, focused on what was happening in terms of the sort of nominal increase uh, in funding for the ABC uh, over the next three years. And they ran this as a distraction. Hmm. For me, uh, there's that analogy about uh, not seeing the, the wood for the trees. Um, the bigger picture and I know you'd uh, agree, and I know Kerry would agree. The bigger picture is that for the last 30 years, funding for the ABC has been cut by 30%. Now, this is, a, this is massive. Uh, and, and the government was able to distract attention from that. We, ha we have seen this organisation that is treasured in Australia. We know it's treasured. We know it's not just you know, us ABC friends on this, uh, on this webinar today who think it's great. Um, there, there are endless surveys done of, of people's views of different organizations and institutions and brands in the market. And the ABC is always in the top there. Whoever's doing the survey, it, with the one exception, when the IPA do surveys, I've never quite understood this, but when the IPA do surveys, they come up with different results. So I'm not quite sure who they're talking to. 
but all the other surveys come out with a with a reflection that the ABC is one of the really truly treasured uh, institutions and trusted institutions uh, in, in, in Australia. This government has been defunding it. Now, when you look at the ABC Act, so the ABC is there by an Act of Parliament, the Act of Parliament says in the charter for the ABC that the ABC should provide innovative and comprehensive broadcasting services of a high standard. Now what this crowd have been doing is they've been undermining the ABC's ability to do this. I mean, I, I think we should push this point uh, very strongly that the, um, that the government, which has inflicted such cuts since 2014, since our... Uh, do any of us really miss Tony? I mean, he's... Um, He's, he's not with us anymore uh, in this country. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the Brits get the benefit of his uh, advice for quite a while yet, really. But uh, you remember that he talked about, uh, he promised no cuts to the uh, ABC or SBS and, and then inflicted swinging cuts uh, on the ABC. So uh, I, in a way, I want to get wrestle this argument back, not to whether... Um, there's uh, uh, the nominal and real stuff around increases over the next three years. I want, to, I want everybody reminded that ABC funding has been cut by 30% over the last 30 years. So that's, that's one point. A second point I want to come to is, is about bias. What I'm hearing more and more, uh, and I know Kerry's uh, wrestled with this over the years as well, it's in his excellent uh, book, uh, his, his, his memoir. And I've also just finished uh, Ken Inglis's two volume uh, mm. book on the, on the ABC. Um, I don't know if you've seen it recently, Kerry, but it has a lot of honorable mentions for you in it. A uh, lot of stories about some of your interactions with um, uh, politicians, particularly uh, in the Howard government, where really the debate we're having now just seems a complete rerun of the discussion uh, when Richard Alston uh, was the Minister for Communications. But the, but the ABC has always been accused of being biased. Um, and so much mud is thrown around that. It's extraordinary that the levels of trust and affection for the ABC have held up in the way that they have. But I think it is damaging for the ABC. Uh, and, and we need to work much harder to get uh, the view across, get the evidence across that the ABC uh, is not biased. And, uh, and I would argue this, um, the ABC is, is endlessly surveyed and what comes out of the surveys for, for decades uh, is that people trust the ABC, they see it as fair and balanced, except extremes on the left and extremes on the right. There's perhaps 15, 20% might be there, but 80% are saying the ABC is um, uh, trustworthy and more trustworthy than any other media, of course. So there's that. Um, the ABC has been the subject of all sorts of different inquiries over the years. And, and often they've begun with people uh, absolutely convinced they've been appointed by the Howard government or they've been appointed by some other, the Fraser government, whoever it has been. And they come in and they're convinced they're going to find uh, evidence that the ABC is biased. And after a considerable uh, time and expense, their reports are, are almost uniform in saying, no, we didn't find bias. What we found was fair and balanced reporting. Now, you're going to love this, I know. Th there's, there's a book I wouldn't put on anybody's Christmas list. It's the, it's the Against Public Broadcasting uh, from the IPA, from Bergen and Davidson. And we have a rant from them about how biased the ABC is. And then, would you believe it, they say, direct and uncontested evidence for bias in the ABC is hard to come by. So we get pages. Now, I don't know, I, I like evidence-led stuff. And here it seems to me they, they rant and rave, but at the end of the day, they really throw the towel in and say, well, we can't find any. I, I think we need to work harder on this, uh, on this uh, ground of whether the ABC is biased or not. It's not. 
and, and as Kerry and Emma have emphasized, it plays such an important role now in how our democracy functions. Um, our democracy is being, well, we, we face enormous threats from manipulation and distortion of data. The ABC plays a vital role in providing information that people can trust. And I don't think democracy functions unless the citizenry are uh, informed and, and know what's, what's happening. So there's a couple of bursts with me from me so far on one on broader long-term funding cuts and two on the issue of bias. I think we've really got to do better on this. Now, my third point I want to make before I uh, finish and I'll soon be having a lie down because all this does get a bit too exciting. But the, th the third point I want to make is the danger that we face, actually really all of our conventional media face from the extraordinary growth uh, of the big tech companies. My worry, twofold worry with the big techs, one is they are so huge that really they, they're going to sweep the board. Um, we know already that uh, massive proportions of people in Britain, uh, the United States and Australia are getting their news, information and entertainment all from the big techs. Um, and uh, it, it, would, it would be a sad day when people no longer turn on the radio or turn on the TV or engage digitally uh, with the ABC. If it all just came through the big decks, uh, I'd be very worried. I'd be very worried, particularly because of what uh, various groups are finding um, about distortion. Uh, and manipulation of data. We, uh, in my view, we haven't, we haven't sufficiently had this debate in Australia. But here uh, are two committees uh, from, the, uh, from the British um, Parliament. The House of Commons, this was under Mrs. Theresa May. So, you know, this wasn't sort of socialism uh, coming to get you. This, this was a conservative committee, select committee, uh, digital culture and media and sport. And it was looking at the impact of the big techs. And it said this, this was two years ago. We are facing nothing less than a crisis in our democracy based on the systematic manipulation of data to support the relentless targeting of citizens without their consent by campaigns of disinformation and messages of hate. Now that was a conservative committee. Well, it was a, that, that was the comment from a conservative chair of the committee, uh, Damien Collins. And just a few weeks ago, the House of Lords uh, Select Committee um, uh, came out with its findings. Uh, and uh, this was a committee on democracy and digital technologies. We're not really doing this sufficiently in Australia. We've fallen behind uh, our friends in the uh, United Kingdom on this. And, and this is what the British House of Lords Committee had to say. It said there's a pandemic of misinformation. It's, there is an existential threat to our democracy and way of life. And I quote, trust is collapsing. People no longer have faith that they can rely on the information they receive or believe what they are told. That is absolutely corrosive for democracy. Now, what I'm saying, friends, to you is that this is extraordinarily important and we need attention to it. I'm going to finish now because I know I can get, um, Getting the nod. <laughs> get too excited, but I um, am deeply appreciative of Kerry uh, and Emma's contribution um, and Cassandra's organizing uh, this event. And I hope we've got some time for comment questions and discussion, but let's keep fighting for the ABC. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thanks everyone. So we've had quite a few questions coming through on the Q&A and I had some in advance. So I'm going to pick up a couple and shortening them from what people said. And the first one follows what you just said, Ed. I think it sort of fits. And it is, are we too polite? At what point should we be manning the barricades? So um, why don't I start with you, Emma? You can answer, what do you think? <laughs> and how do we become less polite? <laughs> Um, I think one of the challenges here is the nature of the uh, of the dispersion of support for the ABC and the people that are really uh, informed about these issues. 
Um, until quite recently, manning the barricades had seemed to have gone out of fashion. Um, and then, of course, we saw the school strikes for climate, which were hugely encouraging about the, um, the willingness of young people to stand up and fight for their future. Um, and I do think to some extent it's necessary to engage young people in this argument. Uh, and we've, we've been poor at doing that. Um, we've been not great as a, as a movement of people that care about these issues um, at speaking with one voice against what is a very coordinated campaign on the other side. Um, so yes, look, I, I think the time for playing nice is over. Um, it doesn't get us anywhere. And as uh, many people have pointed out in regard to the ABC and its um, attitude to government over the last few years, acquiescence doesn't work. Um, um, bending over for a bully doesn't work. Um, we actually do need to stand up. And as Kerry alluded to earlier, it's very difficult for journalists who have their livelihood and their income held over their head. They're on temporary contracts. They have no job security um, to be as as vocal as they might like in defending the institution and to bite the hand that feeds, particularly when there are so few alternative sources of employment for a journalist today. And so I think it is up to some of the rest of us um, to, to be more vocal in saying, well, this isn't, this isn't business as usual. Yes, both sides of politics have always accused the ABC of bias. They've always been hostile to some extent to the ABC because the ABC was doing its job in holding government to account. But this is an extraordinary attack in extraordinary times. And so it requires an extraordinary response. Um, I don't think that means becoming um, intemperate and losing our cool as I unfortunately did on Monday evening, um, watching Kerry on Q&A um, and making personal attacks on individuals. Um, but I think it does mean that we need to stand up and say, no, uh, we are going to mobilise and we are going to do everything we can. And each of us has to do everything we can. I'm going to sound a bit like Michael Moore in the US now, who is saying, uh, if people don't get out to vote, in November, then Trump could win again. It doesn't matter what the Democratic Party does. Um, we don't have that issue with voting here because we have compulsory voting, but each and every one of you needs to sign up 10 people that have never thought about this issue and get in their ears and talk to them about the impact on their lives of um, the, the attacks and the undermining of such an essential um, piece of, of democratic infrastructure and try to convert the unconverted, I think is, is, the, big, is the big challenge. Thanks. Um, Kerry, would you like to, to follow on? The, I mean, as we get older, I think we feel less polite, don't we? <laughs> oh, I, I can remember, I can remember back in 1976, 77, when Malcolm Fraser was Prime Minister in his first term. And of course, in their first budget, there were, guess what, ABC cuts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I can remember one protest where staff picked up their placards and wrote some placards and uh, prepared for a protest was was when after that round of cuts some gormless people associated with the inventors program what well, I you know I don't know whose idea it was but it was foolish that they and offensive that they acted on it but Malcolm Fraser was actually invited to present the winners of the inventors program of that year and uh, and uh, we decided to uh, be there at the entrance to the ABC at Gore Hill in Sydney when Malcolm Fraser and Tammy arrived. Uh, but we decided beforehand that there were going to be no heckles. Uh, there were no insults being hurled. Uh, but what Malcolm and Tammy had to do was walk a gauntlet of silent people just watching them as they walked past. And Tammy leapt out of the the car with a big smile on her face, thinking it was some kind of uh, greeting committee. And then the smile froze on her face and Malcolm looked very stern and, un and uncomfortable indeed as they had to walk that gauntlet. Now, I'm not suggesting that that should become a model of anything else, but the point was uh, a protest where no one actually said anything, but there were some placards making plain why we were there. And for that, it was a very effective protest. Uh, I just think there has to be consistency there has to be really careful thought about what is going to count. Um, I mean, unfortunately, uh, for me personally, I only really stopped to think about how important the, the Eden Monero by-election was uh, just in its dying moments. Um, but, uh, but, and I know that there was a real presence. I know the alumni were somewhat engaged. I know that, uh, that the friends were right in there. Um, 
but uh, but and and I don't know that there's actually been a um, a proper analysis of of um, what part the ABC played as an issue in that, but clearly it was there. Clearly it was one of the two or three um, most sort of vibrant issues, if you like. And I think we've got to be constantly scanning the landscape for those moments and making the most of them. When you, you talk about manning the barricades and all the rest of it, I mean, I, I, I don't, no one should lose their passion. No one should, uh, should hesitate in stepping forward and speaking in a very forthright and passionate way. But um, but I, I think that I think that we should set a kind of standard uh, for 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 thoughtful telling protest that is designed to strike a mark, and it's mm -hmm. not it's not about us picking one side of politics over another. The, the the conservative governments of the past few years have made themselves a target, and have made it very plain what their agenda is, and we have every right and indeed a duty to respond to that. Ed, do you want to make any comment? Uh, look, I don't think I've, I've got any, anything really to add. I mean, friends, I think, have um, certainly tried to um, reach out to uh, br more broadly to different cohorts across our community. At a meeting recently, somebody was telling me that it was, it was their children who would be most incensed uh, if the ABC was privatised. He said, you know, you get four and five-year-olds in the street. And I thought that was a that was a lovely thought. Um, so we are thinking about that. And I, I think sometimes when you get when you hit it right, either with rallies or with by elections, uh, as a as a community group, you can make a difference and you can influence a result. I think we saw that in the Wentworth by election uh, when Karen Phelps uh, achieved what was it a, almost a twenty percent swing. And certainly ABC friends were, were working very hard in that um, by-election to make sure that a candidate favorable to the ABC um, was, uh, was elected. But yeah, uh, I absolutely agree with what Kerry and Emma were saying. Can I just add one thing there, Cassandra? I think it's, yes. as a parent of a young a child who, whom you saw earlier, um, and knowing that when we were um, grappling with the switch to digital television um, in the Rudd and Gillard governments, the biggest driver was ABC Kids. It was the mm. thing that got more people to switch to a, a digital set. We need to engage those parents. And after this COVID lockdown, I would be, my mental health would be in the toilet without ABC Kids. I know I can put Iris in front of it and I can get a bit of work done. So I think there's an army of parents of young yeah. children there to, um, to galvanise. Um, and I also think that, you know, e effectively, as Kerry said, we need to be really strategic about this and, and target different sections differently. Yes. The, other, the other very quickly thing I'd like to add is that, um, and, and you've no doubt done work talking to the various independents and so on. Um, there are a lot of very reasonable, rational people uh, holding independent seats these days. And, and I think um, to the extent that there is still scope to be talking further with these people, I, I think that they should be led to believe and understand uh, that this, that the ABC should be a part of the badge of what they stand for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and particularly uh, someone like um, uh, Zali Steggles uh, in, in, the, uh, in, a, in a seat like, um, like Warringah. Yeah. Uh, which would be riddled with ABC viewers and, and to actually lead thinking conservatives who, who themselves um, um, regard the ABC as important to actually be marshaled uh, to, to, to hear their voice heard as well with mm. their own side of politics. Mm. And to, push, and to push the Labor Party to make it an election issue too. You know, we can't yeah. let them off the hook. Yeah. You, know, you need to push the Labor Party to stand up and say, well, we're going to take this on and we're going to make some real commitments um, that, will, that will differentiate us. That, that's essential. Thanks. I think um, we've been thinking about some of these things and uh, particularly targeting particular groups and especially parents, we must say, and families. So it's good to hear you make those points. I'm going to ask a question, especially of Kerry, but others might, might want to comment, just in case we don't get to too many. This is just a sort of a nostalgia bit. Of all the interviews you did over the years, Kerry, 
which one or which couple stand out as most memorable? Oh, uh, look, there, there were, I mean, it's part of the privilege of a job like that, that you get to actually do so many uh, interesting interviews with so many people who have important things to say or entertaining things to say or whatever. If there is a single interview, and, I, and I've never tried to isolate one or two or three or four, it's like, it's like asking you what your favourite book is. Yeah. But, uh, but I suppose if there was one that I uh, uh, was seriously pleased uh, to have been able to do was to interview Nelson Mandela the day he moved into the, into the uh, uh, president's mm. official residence in Pretoria uh, after winning that uh, historic election. Uh, and uh, to actually be, uh, as I waited for him, as I subsequently discovered what he was doing, he was in the next room meeting every uh, South African police chief. And of course, um, if there were any uh, black South Africans in the room, there might have been one, possibly two, I don't know. Uh, but he was saying to those people, uh, it is critical that we work together. He was essentially saying, um, you know, no, I'm not going to throw you all out. But you'd better be. But you better understand what we're about and what your part in this is going to have to be. And if you're not prepared to to embrace the future and understand what this democratic election was about, uh, then um, then goodbye. Uh, but but he but that that sense of reconciliation and of reaching across. He had sat across the and was sitting across the table uh, with. Uh, the, this is the 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 cabinet room table. Uh, in uh, in their parliament, he was sitting across the table from people who had been part of a process to try and kill him, and he was prepared to do that. Yeah. Now that was a very special uh, leader indeed, and to actually, particularly at that moment in history, to be able to engage in a conversation with him for Lateline uh, was a serious privilege and one I'll never forget. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a great answer. And, and, if, and if Lakeline hadn't existed, that interview would never have been done. Well, I was thinking about Lakeline and I was thinking about it, you know, especially some of those early years of Lakeline when you would just bring in such amazing uh, speakers from all over the world. And, and, and I was thinking, you know, how much I miss that really, you know, um, that yeah. was such an important aspect of that program. And it was just must watch TV. <laughs> you would stay up, you know. And, and influential yeah. television as well. You know, we, we often hear now that the reason that the Murdoch press has an outsized influence compared to it, and particularly the Australian, compared to its readership, is because it's read by politicians and, and journalists. But Lateline was must see viewing for everyone in that par in Parliament. And it was the program that politicians wanted to be on if they were going to push their agenda. So it was, it was such an important part of our democratic infrastructure. Yes, mm. it really was. I wish we had it still, or we had it coming back. Um, another question I have here, and that is, has the ABC become too fe fearful of, um, of two things really, of offending its source of funding, that's government, but also um, fearful because it might be raided by security services or, you know, or AFP or whatever. Is that, um, uh, Quentin Dempster talked about this kind of preemptive way in which the ABC might avoid, uh, you know, sort of tough interviews or taking tough decisions. Is there that sort of nervousness within the ABC now? Ed, do you want to start on that? I'll just make a, a, a quick comment. Uh, it was precisely this point was raised in a Senate inquiry um, a couple of years ago. I think it was the inquiry following the uh, sort of dramatic week when the uh, chair of the AB, when the managing director was basically sacked and then the, and then the chair resigned. And there was a Senate inquiry into, um, uh, in, into possible interference in the a uh, ABC. It attracted a lot of submissions and one of the submissions cogently argued, it might have been from the MEAA, it might have been from the ABC alumni, actually, I think it was from the ABC alumni. Their concern was that staff were fearful 
of um, uh, things that, that were said uh, in, in an environment where funding was being cut in the way that has been cut. And w what emerged out of that period was, was evidence that, you know, prime ministers were ringing up um, the chair of the ABC and saying, you know, shoot that reporter, get rid of that reporter, and, and so on. Um, stuff that is, is of massive uh, concern. And uh, I think it's highly possible that uh, a ABC stuff certainly demoralized whether they're also cowed, uh, I would think that's a high possibility. Yeah. Would either ever or Kerry, would you like to say something? Well, I think, uh, I think the most insidious form of censorship of all is self-censorship mm. uh, mm. because it's very hard to be measured and you often don't see it. Self-censorship mm. uh, is, often, is often perpetrated in the mind of somebody and, and uh, something might be headed off at the pass that should be seeing the light of day, but it's not. A story, a story might be nipped in the bud before it even gets going. And uh, I'm not saying that that's rampant in the ABC, but I'm saying it's a serious concern. And the more bullying goes on and the, and the more the, the, the sword of budget cuts is felt and the more people see others being marched out the door or walking out the door, um, the greater the likelihood of that developing. Mm. And, uh, and uh, I don't like it for one minute. Uh, and, and I think it's something that staff uh, need to be absolutely alert to. But um, it's easy for us on the outside to, uh, to mm. say that. It's very difficult mm. that sometimes if you're sitting in the seat. Very hard, yes. Emma? Um, no, I, I think I, I disagree with Kerry there. I think the real, it's, it's not so much that, um, that journalists are deliberately playing a game. It's that, it's that feeling of, of mm. being cautious um, and the insecurity that comes in this political environment um, that's, that really hampers journalists' ability to do the kind of fearless work mm. that they should be able to do with the security of a, public's, of a public broadcasting job. Yeah. There are, there's a lot more questions here, but unfortunately we've reached five and we said it would finish at five o'clock. So I'll close now. But this, this has just been fantastic. Um, I mean, from my point of view, you've made me more determined. We just have to, we just have to campaign. This isn't a standalone event. We are going to be campaigning through to the budget and then we plan to campaign through next year. Um, we, you know, there'll probably be more setbacks, but that won't stop us. I mean, we're quite determined to keep fighting in support of the ABC. Uh, in this next period, there'll be an emphasis on regional activity, and I think that will happen more and more. And certainly, we're very conscious of the need for a more nuanced approach to campaigning in which we do talk to particular groups and try to build alliances with unusual allies. So there will be follow-up activities. And for everyone who's watching, you will get invited. And the people who didn't make it today will also be invited. And I think, I think we've probably you know, said as much as we can say today. I just want to thank the three of you very, very much for giving up your time. It was extremely stimulating and I hope we see a lot more of you. Thanks very much. And I, want to just bring in, I just want to bring in a person standing in the wings here to say hello and goodbye. Uh, yes. somebody, somebody very dear to the, just bend down a little bit more. Yes. Hang on. Ah. Somebody, somebody very important and very dear to the ABC for a yes, long time. Yes, indeed. George. Uh, thank you. Well, I, was, yeah. I was listening to all that and it, 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 I found it very, very encouraging. The people are so committed that they are. Yep. Well, well, I had my life at the ABC and I, I really don't know how this how this country would survive without it. You haven't got uh, to talk to, to Jim. George, can we put our, you down for our... George, can we put you down for our next webinar? <laughs> <laughs> We'd love it. It'd be great. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Without the ABC, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's brilliant. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for Thank attending. You. We'll see Thank you again you. soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.